I'm so glad that you've tuned in to one of the sermons from St Mary's. If you're new to our church and would like to find out more about being involved, please visit our website and drop us a line. We'd love to hear from you. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of the prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us, and freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us to be a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and on his account all the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Really lovely, as Joe said, to be kind of kicking off this uh, series uh, that we're starting in Revelation. And before we do that, we're going to pray. Loving God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that it's alive and active. Thank you that it challenges us and excites us and equips us. Pray that you would help us to. Be attentive to your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me tell you about the first time that I went on a proper roller coaster. I can vividly remember it. Um, it was called The Dragon, and it was at a small fun fair uh, near to where my grandparents lived. And I'd been to that fun fair several times um, before, and I'd observed other people bravely riding on this roller coaster, and now it was my turn. And I remember the feeling that I had in my stomach as we clicked up that kind of first slope to what felt like to me as a child, um, a sky high peak. In reality, it was probably a few meters above the ground. Um, and then I remember screaming with a mixture of terror and delight as we plummeted down and around the bends. And finally, as the ride ended, we returned to where we began. I suspect that if we choose to ride the roller coaster of Revelation this term, then we might be in for a similar mixture of horror and exhilarating joy because Revelation has more than a few twists and turns and plenty of highs and lows. But if there's one thing that we can be sure of, that is that if we get on board this roller coaster and enter into the ride through Revelation, we are not going to end up back where we started. Because Revelation is a book that is more about transformation than information. And so as we explore Revelation, we should expect ourselves to be changed, to be changed by the loving power of Jesus at work in our lives. So that's the, the big 
statement at the beginning of this series, come with us on the ride, but expect to be changed. There is a very funny um, Mr. Bean sketch, which I saw um, a few weeks ago, where he is riding a roller coaster. And he, you see him surrounded by screaming people as the train takes them up and down and loop the loop. And Mr. Bean is completely unfazed. <laughs> it is as if his body is riding the roller coaster and his mind is somewhere else entirely. And it would be possible, I think, for us to approach Revelation in that way. We could come faithfully week by week, we could hear the talks, but not really join in with the journey. And so my hope and prayer and that of the other uh, leaders here is that we will embark together in this, that we'll find ways to engage deeply with this challenging and exciting part of the Bible over these next three months. And I pray that we will find ourselves inspired to go deeper than what we're hearing together on Sundays. I really pray that we're going to dig deeper and discuss what we're uncovering. And as we do that, I really pray that this is a season in our life as a church which helps us to deepen that sense of togetherness as the body of Christ. And in doing so, I pray that there'll be collective transformation that as St Mary's we will be changed as well as as individuals we will be changed but before we kind of buckle up and get started on that roller coaster I want to offer a reassurance a warning and a recommendation okay reassurance a warning and a recommendation so the reassurance John tells us right at the very beginning of Revelation, we just heard it said uh, just now, he says, we will be blessed. He says, blessed are those who hear and keep what is written here. That's Revelation 1 verse 3. God is going to bless us as we encounter him through his word. And that is good news. So we can prepare to be blessed. Here's the warning. Here's the caveat. It's about how we engage with what we hear. I wonder whether or not it might be helpful and it might not. Um, but to think of the book of Revelation a bit like an unexploded bomb. You know, people kind of still occasionally come across those from uh, the war. We definitely shouldn't ignore it as one shouldn't um, ignore an unexploded bomb. But also we shouldn't come and attack it and try and break it down into its tiniest components. We need to give it due care and attention. But if we dismantle it and look at every tiny detail and try and work out what every single one of them means, we're likely to get lost in a fog which is hard to return from. And maybe for the first few weeks, you might be thinking, why did Gemma give us that warning? at the beginning but believe me when we get to the middle section <laughs> I think you will <laughs> we will all do well to remember that caveat so we've heard the reassurance we've heard the warning now to the recommendation um, you will perhaps if you were here last week have already heard me talk um, about this book but um, you're going to continue to hear I think the preachers make reference to see the strange it's by somebody called Brett Davies um, and if you are at all interested in Revelation and digging a bit deeper, I would really, really recommend this book to you. I think it will be a hugely helpful travel guide as we take that tour across the landscape of Revelation. In the first chapter of that book, Brett Davis says this. He says, I've come to see Revelation as a beautiful book an ingenious, inspired masterpiece of literature, calling us into beautiful lives, worthy of the beautiful future, prepared for the world by our beautiful God. It might be that at this point in time, um, some of us don't think we actually really agree with that statement because I think that that's putting Revelation up as um, 
something that we will really be excited about exploring. And actually, we might not feel like that at the moment. Until fairly recently, I was quite wary of Revelation. And I know that lots of others feel the same. I don't think that beautiful would have been a word that I would have used to describe this part of the Bible. But what I realized was that although having read it kind of several times probably over the course of my life and definitely having read some bits of it more than others, I realized that there was a whole lot more to discover about the big picture of what it's trying to show us, or rather who it's trying to show us. Because there are definitely, definitely some very confusing parts of Revelation, and actually there are some quite scary parts too. But ultimately, Revelation is telling us the story of Jesus. It does it in a very different way to the way that the gospel writers tell the story of Jesus. Their approach is much more like a biography, whereas um, as you read through Revelation, it actually feels a bit more like a graphic novel. That's the kind of um, modern word for sort of cartoon strip. It's worth noting, though, at this point that John, who was the one who had this vision and who wrote Revelation, is actually the same John who wrote John's gospel. And so here we have the same person telling the same story, but actually using two very different styles, but ultimately communicating the same thing, that God himself is going to bring full and complete salvation to the world. That is what Revelation is trying to say, trying to show us. It's how God is going to save the world. And that's why we should expect to be transformed by what we discover here in Revelation. Because we're going to find out, and so many of us will already know it, but that love wins. It is painful, it is messy, it is costly, but love will win and the ending is glorious. I don't think that's too much of a spoiler alert. Love always transforms and changes us. And so my prayer is that we will encounter God's love in new ways as we take this journey through Revelation and that actually we will see him differently. Because at its heart, Revelation is a book that tries to help us to see things clearly. The clue is in its name, in ancient Greek, as the title, John would have written the word apocalypse. That means revealing or unveiling. It's a disclosure of something that had been previously hidden. And in this awesome vision that John has, that God has given him, God shows him what is going on behind the scenes of the universe. It's like he takes him backstage and gives him this new vantage point to help him and us understand how God's plan of salvation is going to play out. The gospel writers show us Jesus in all of his wonderful and beautiful humanity, whilst also making it clear that he is divine. In Revelation, we get this glimpse of the cosmic Jesus, his majesty and his power on full display, but without losing that connection to his flesh and his blood. And so Revelation is not primarily concerned about showing us the future. Revelation wants to show us Jesus. In fact, it's a revealing about Jesus from Jesus. The future is important, and we need to hold on to that vision of the new creation, what's coming after this world ends. We need the confidence that love wins, because those things keep us going as we journey through our lives on earth. But we're invited to keep our eyes on Jesus, as opposed to 
analyzing the signs and trying to work out what stage we're at in relation to the end times. Brett Davis in his book says this, the goal of revelation is that we would faithfully follow the lamb through suffering and into the sunrise of his new world. Faithfully follow the lamb. Keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. And if we're doing that, then we know we're on the right track. Next week, we're going to hear the rest of chapter one, and Simon's going to set things a bit more in context for us. He's going to help us to get to know John a little better and the world in which John was living. But for now, I'm just going to draw our attention to a couple of things from these first eight verses. And the first is this, that Revelation often puts familiar things in a strange way in order to get us to sit up and take notice. So that's something that we find um, here in the first chapter, and you might have it open in front of you, but um, also throughout the whole book. So in verse four of chapter one, we hear this, grace and peace to you from God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's what we might expect him to say, apologies. Um, we might be expecting John to say, grace and peace from God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But actually what he writes, in verse four is this grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from jesus christ the faithful witness the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth okay do you see the difference we were expecting him to say god the father son and holy spirit and in, and actually what he says is a lot more than that it's quite an involved description in essence, John is saying, grace and peace to you from the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. But because he puts it in that kind of different way, we're invited into something deeper. And that might lead us into new understanding and insight. The other thing uh, just to note, which is going to set us up and help us as we work through Revelation, is that we're also going to see numbers used in really surprising ways. So we're used to taking numbers literally, aren't we? So when we say three, usually we mean three. Whereas in Revelation, numbers are rarely supposed to be taken literally. They're usually meant to be symbolic, okay? So in that verse four that I just read out, um, we hear about the seven spirits. We know it's talking about the Holy Spirit, but that doesn't mean that somehow the Holy Spirit has seven parts. It's using that number seven, which has a lot of symbolism around it, to kind of say, this letter is from the full, complete Spirit of God, who is everywhere, always animating everything. Because seven is that number of completeness. Seven is perfection. Six, by contrast, symbolizes imperfection, incompleteness. As a number, six is woefully inadequate. We'll return to that another day. But Revelation is going to give us lots of opportunities to ponder on numbers and their deeper meanings. So as we read Revelation, we need to expect things to feel strange and sound strange, because that is John's intention. He's trying to write in a way that will startle us and make us take notice. He wants to shake us from our apathy and to help us to see Jesus in a new way. But as I said earlier, the message of Revelation is the same as the message of the Gospels. It's the same message that runs through the whole Bible. It is grace and peace. God's salvation plan is grace and peace. Jesus's purpose is to save our broken lives, to save our broken world. And as we see time and time again throughout the scripture, healing, salvation, is painful and costly. 
but Jesus is completely devoted to it. For him, it is so painful and so costly, it leads him to the cross and to death. We come into land this morning. I want to end with just one final analogy, and I can't claim it's my own, but I do think that it's really helpful one to have in our minds as we traverse this revelation landscape. Some of you, I know, will have had the awful experience of having had chemotherapy treatment for cancer or supporting somebody who you love through that process. And I haven't um, been in that boat, but I know enough about how chemo works to understand that often the patient gets sicker before they get better. The treatment for ridding the cancer that's invaded the person's body is violent and it's destructive and it hurts. But cancer patients often persevere with that brutal regime because it's their best hope of getting better. The chemotherapy drugs are not intended to kill, but to heal. We need to be careful not to push this analogy too far, but it might be helpful to think of what we will encounter in Revelation as God's chemotherapy for the world. The way that God is going to pour out his healing his grace and his peace is through his judgment of sin. God's judgment of creation will destroy everything in the world which isn't life. It's his way of getting rid of the bad cells but keeping the good cells. And when we experience within our hearts that I come Lord Jesus, which is what we've called this revelation series, because it's we know deep down that there is so much wrong with our world. And we recognize that there is much that is wrong within our own hearts. We know that the problem of sin is of pandemic proportions and that the only way to make things right, to clean up the mess, to get rid of sin, is for Jesus to come again, to come in judgment, and to burn away all that is not life, and all that is not love. And Jesus will come again. Revelation is absolutely clear about that. But when he does, there will be groaning. There will be pain because he's going to get rid of all the darkness, that which is in the world and that which is in each of us. His aim is to heal through his grace and peace. His aim is to make the whole of creation fully alive once more, ready to spend eternity with him. But like that chemotherapy treatment, it is not going to be an easy ride for the world when that happens. The roller coaster is a bumpy one. But Jesus is with us in the carriage. He's next to us all the way. He's reassuring us at every twist and turn that the end is in sight and our future is secure because we believe in him. Love wins. Jesus is with us. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end and everything in between. And so if we keep our eyes fixed on him, we have nothing to fear. going to do the thing that is absolutely right and appropriate to do now and that is to turn to him in prayer and Sue's going to lead us in that. Mm -hmm.